So I'm just going to start by welcoming Jill. Um, Jill, very grateful for you to take the time to do this. I'm really excited about this. Um, for those who don't know Jill, uh, you'll get to meet her throughout the session. She's a data scientist at Shopify. Uh, she tackles a lot of um, interesting data problems and she works on the international team. Outside of her work, uh, she spends her time participating in datathons. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with datathons, they're hackathons for data scientists and they're really fun, often taking place over the weekend and people stay up all night doing them. <laughs> they're a good time. Uh, she's also running events for Pi Ladies and Pi Data Toronto, uh, and she plays tennis when it's warm enough <laughs> to go outside. Pi Ladies is very, very interesting. And may maybe Joe, you can um, include the link for Pi Ladies and, and Pi Data Toronto. It's uh, those are two great uh, local events, and um, they do some events throughout the year too. So that'd be awesome if um, people could join that um, as well. So, anyways, I'll let you, um, I'll let you kick things off, Joe. Um, feel free those to uh, post questions in the chat and I'll be here as well, but I'm just going to give you the uh, co-hosting duties. Oh, maybe I don't need to. I think you're good. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll get started. Thank you. Thanks for the intro, Dave. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, like Dave said, my name's Jill. Um, I uh, am also a co-organizer for Pilates Toronto. I just posted the link there. So if any of you are interested in attending community events um, that involve all things Python. It's open to people of all genders. Um, we haven't had too many events happening during COVID, but we hope to plan a couple of virtual ones soon. So it would be great for more people to, to join in on that. Um, but anyways, uh, uh, that's about enough about me. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about how to build a recommender system from scratch. And so uh, I can't see anyone on the screen right now, but I'm just wondering if anyone here has experience with recommender systems and has tried building one, even a small one um, in the past. You can also just post in the chat if uh, that's easier. Cool. Is anyone familiar with the concept of collaborative filtering or content-based filtering? Great. Okay, so some have some some are, are somewhat familiar. Uh, Nina, Jenwei, Linda, they are familiar. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, we're gonna learn about what these concepts are, and we're also gonna be building and implementing them using Python. So I will just share my screen. I have a bit of a presentation to show first, and then we'll get straight into the tutorial. Um, but actually, maybe before I start presenting, I'll just share this link with you. Um, this repo, um, one second. So can you see my screen? Okay, perfect. Uh, so this repo has all of the content for our workshop. Um, there are two notebooks. So there's a tutorial workbook and a tut tutorial walkthrough. This walkthrough is what we're gonna be going over. So it's like a fill in the blank type of thing. Um, and you can either uh, run this locally on your machine using Jupyter Notebooks. If you don't have this installed or you don't have a a Jupyter Notebook environment on your laptop, what you can do is use Google Collab. So all you need for this is a Gmail account. And um, what you can do is just uh, duplicate this notebook, um, but I'll walk through this um, after my presentation. Just wanted to like have this link open here and available so that you can uh, slowly get ready for our walkthrough. Um, but in the meantime, let me just get my slides ready. So build a movie lens recommender system from scratch. As some of you are probably already aware, recommenders are everywhere. Um, Amazon, Netflix, LinkedIn. Um, in a world with so many options, we are recommended things every day from what pair of jeans to buy, to what news article to read, to what job we should apply to, or even who to who like we should go on a date with. Um, 
Recommenders are also super hot, a super hot topic in e-commerce. Um, but back in the day when e-commerce didn't exist, things were sold exclusively in brick and mortar stores. So a, a store's inventory was limited to the space of the store and products that didn't sell well became unprof unprofitable. So the logical choice was to sell the most popular mainstream products. But once e-commerce came along, it changed the way we sold things. We now have an unlimited inventory, which means that niche products that were previously neglected in stores are now easily accessible online. And if you read the book, The Long Tail, you'll learn that niche products generate a surprisingly huge amount of revenue in online retail. In the book, um, in the, book the Long Tail, Chris Anderson writes, a physical store cannot be reconfigured on the fly to cater to each customer based on his or her particular interests. The beauty of an online store though, is that it can. Having a massive selection of offerings doesn't necessarily mean that users will buy more stuff though. So in, two, in the year 2000, there was a study conducted at a supermarket tasting booth. One booth had six samples of jam and the other booth had 24. The booth with more samples attracted more customers. It generated more initial interest, but interestingly, the booth with fewer samples, so only six jams, um, had a much higher conversion rate, while the booths with while the booth with only 24 samples had a, a low conversion rate, so only three percent. So, um, of the customers that went to the the booth with fewer samples, they were more likely to buy a sample of jam. Um, and this finding basically um, shows that having a wide variety of options may seem appealing to customers, but it's been shown to reduce their motivation to later on purchase a product. Um, and sometimes this is known as like choice paralysis. Um, in the book, Paradox of Choice, Barry Schwartz talks about how having too many options can be too stressful. And this is why recommenders are important. And this is what, why so many um, e-commerce platforms and um, other platforms like Netflix or LinkedIn, they kind of filter out the most important um, and most relevant items to a user or a customer. Now you're probably wondering what is a recommender system? A recommender system is just like any machine learning model. You start with some data, you pass it into the model and it outputs predictions. In this scenario, our data is a user's preference towards a product. This can be either in the form of explicit feedback where a user directly likes or rates an item. So for example, um, on IMDB, for, um, you can give a rating from, on a scale from one to five, that would be explicit feedback. Or there's also something called implicit feedback, which is more subtle. And it includes indirect behavior such as how many times did you replay a song, how long did you read an article for, or um, how many times did you buy the same thing on Amazon. By feeding this data into a recommender system, we get predictions about a user's future behavior. So which song they'll like next, which movie they'll binge watch, or what product they're more likely to buy. These are what we call recommendations. The two most important approaches to recommender systems are collaborative filtering and content-based filtering. So collaborative filtering is based on the premise that similar people like similar things. Let's say we're building a movie recommender. It doesn't know who we are or what the movie is. It only looks at our interactions and the interactions of other, user, other users with the movie. So the core data of collaborative filtering is the user item matrix, or as we like to call the utility matrix. Um, so in this matrix, each row represents a user and each column represents a movie. The cells represent a user's rating towards a movie. And our goal in collaborative filtering is to fill in these blanks. So to guess what a user would have rated an item or a movie um, based on their past rating behaviors. One barrier though with collaborative filtering is something called the cold start problem. So when we have new users or new movies, so in this case, like entirely empty rows or entirely um, empty columns, 
we're not able to generate recommendations for these people with collaborative filtering. Um, it just doesn't work. So what we can do instead is use a technique called content-based filtering. And content-based content filtering tackles a cold start problem because it looks at the content of users and movies, the features. It takes into consideration your traits, such as gender and age, as well as traits of the movie, such as the year it was produced or whether it was funny or scary. Um, and it doesn't need to know anything about ratings. So in the tutorial today, we are going to explore both of these concepts. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, um, for the environment setup, uh, you can either run the notebook locally, you can run the notebook in the cloud, um, and we're going to be using something called the Movie Lens data, data set. So Movie Lens was created by the University of Minnesota. Um, it was with and within this university, there's a group called Group Lens, um, and they have this platform where anyone can sign up and recommend or and rate movies, and it'll generate recommendations for you. The beauty of this, though, is that as you participate in the Movie Lens platform, you're actually contributing your data to this massive data set that they've created, which is now used um, for many research projects and um, also for teaching. So we're going to be using the Movie Lens data set. It's basically the Titanic data set of recommenders, and it's pretty awesome. Um, if you're interested in getting record, like being generated recommendations yourself on movies, um, feel free to sign up for a Movie Lens account. And indirectly, you're actually contributing to recommender research, which is pretty cool. OK, so um, I hope you can all still see my screen here um, with the GitHub page. So like I said before, we are going to get started with this tutorial. And um, for those of you who are going to run this locally, you should open up the tutorial walkthrough notebook. Um, and it should look like this with um, empty blanks here, or like blanks. Um, and for those of you who are not, who are going to be going with the other option to run it on the Google, on Google um, Collab, uh, you should open this notebook. So just click on this link, which will take you to Google Collab. And if you have a Gmail account, which is the only requirement, what you can do is just save this to your drive and then you can start working on it directly and it, it'll become it's you're basically duplicating it um, and you can make all these changes and and save it um, within your own account so for me i am going to be using the jupyter notebook version so uh, i already have this set up for myself and i have opened the, the tutorial walkthrough um, everyone see this? One sec. Okay. If anyone has any questions, um, or you want to like, just stop and think, wait a minute, what are we doing? Or how do we install this? Or if you have any technical issues, also feel free to just, uh, ping in the chat or also speak up uh, uh, like directly. Rochelle says, where do we get the link from? Oh, OK, I'm going to repost the link. So I am posting the link in the chat. And you either clone the repo and then um, spin up your own Jupyter notebook server and uh, open tutorial walkthrough. Or you can go to Google Collab um, in the link that I just showed earlier and um, duplicate the notebook and edit it from there. Awesome. Cool. So here's the tutorial outline. Um, it's broken down into seven steps. Um, like I said, we're using the Movie Lens data set. Um, but, uh, so the steps are importing the dependencies, loading the data, exploring the data, um, pre-processing the data, and then we're going to get into actually building the recommender system. So collaborative filter, we're going to do collaborative filtering using a technique called K-nearest neighbors. Um, 
we're going to handle the cold start problem um, with content-based filtering. And then lastly, we're going to use um, apply something called matrix factorization um, if we have enough time. Alrighty. So the first thing we have to do is import our dependencies. Um, the packages that we're going to be using today are NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and Seaborn. Um, is everyone here familiar with these packages, particularly Pandas um, and Matplotlib? Awesome, cool. Um, so yeah, we're going to be doing a lot of data manipulation initially. Um, so having some experience with Pandas would be awesome. Um, okay, so step two, we are going to load the data and we are loading this data from um, the MovieLens site. I already did this for us ahead of time. So I have these links here, which are hosted in AWS. But what you can also do is um, download it yourself. So if you go to this link, you'll see there are all sorts of um, different variations of the data set you can look at. So the more recent, like a massive one has 25 million ratings. Um, some of them have synthetic data or synthetic data sets with 1 billion ratings. Um, but for us, we're going to be looking at the uh, small latest data set, which is good for education. And um, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty comprehensive. Okay, so we're going to load our data sets, ratings, movies. And we're going to take a look at what these look like. So ratings, we can see that um, there are four columns, user ID, movie ID, rating, movies.head, and then movies, movie ID, title, and genre. And so the first thing that we're going to focus on is ratings. Um, so let's just first see how many ratings there are. Um, we can do that by just getting the length of the data set, so length of ratings. Um, so here, this represents a, a rating made by a user for a given movie. We're just counting how many ratings there are in this data set, and then how many movies. Um, we could do ratings, movie ID, dot, and unique. That will get, get us the number of unique movies ratings, and then for number of users, ratings, user ID dot and unique. Cool. And if we run this, we can see that there are just over 100,000 ratings, um, just a little less than 10,000 movie IDs, um, 600 users, and we can see that the average number of ratings per user is 165. So that's quite a bit, a um, lot of data. That's probably not um, the most realistic, uh, the most realistic data that we would get. Like this seems pretty dense. And in most cases, we'd have very sparse data with people only having a couple of interactions with the movie. Um, but anyways, uh, average number of ratings for a movie is 10. Okay, so let's now look at the distribution of ratings. Um, I like using this package called Seaborn, um, and it's really it works really nicely with data frames. So since we have our ratings data frame, we're just going to um, look at the distribution of ratings. We want to like I'm just curious to know how many of our users are pessimists or awesome optimists? Are we getting a ton of ratings that are like four and fives? Or is it kind of uniformly distributed? We can see, though, that there are quite a few ratings that are um, leaning more towards the optimist or like positive side. Um, a lot of fours, fives, some threes, not so many ones and twos, which I think is pretty common. Usually when people decide to rate something, they'll rate something that they like and they'll they'll give it a good rating. Okay, so let's see what the mean global rating is, 3.5. And then we can also see what the mean um, 
what the, re the mean rating is per user. So to do that, we're going to group our ratings by user ID. And then for each user ID, we're gonna get the rating and calculate the mean. So the mean rating per user is 3.66. Cool. So which movies are most frequently rated? Um, here to do that, um, what we could do is do um, ratings movie ID value counts. But the thing is, we don't know. So, so this is telling us movie ID 356 has 329 ratings, but we don't actually know what this movie is, like what the title is. So what we can do is actually get the movie title by merging um, or joining the movies data frame with the ratings data frame. So let's just do that really quick. So we'll do ratings merge it with movies, and then we're going to merge it on movie ID. Oops. Yeah. So movie ratings. So we're just um, adding some extra info to our ratings data set. And now let's just try this same process again. But instead of looking at movie ID, we'll just look at title. And let's look at the first, the top 10. So these are the movies that have the most ratings. Forrest Gump, Shawshank Redemption, Pulp Fiction. Um, they are the most pot, like they're, they, they have been rated the most. So now let's see what the highest and lowest rated movies are. We can do this by um, getting the mean rating for a movie and then finding out which one has the lowest rating and which one has the highest rating. I'm just reading this message. It'd be neat to try looking at the number of times a movie has been viewed, started, versus how many times it's been rated to estimate more data in the negative end of this of the spectrum. Yes, totally. Um, I think that it would be really interesting to, to get this implicit data. Um, in fact, a lot of re research has shown that implicit data is probably the gold standard for, for using in, in terms of like movie recommendations because oftentimes people give biased ratings uh, on movies um, and the best way to really know what movie a person likes is by looking at their behaviors. For example, I remember listening to a talk where they said many times you'll see this awesome documentary and think yeah that's five stars but it's not like you're going to want to watch that every single day. Whereas maybe there's another guilty pleasures show that you are kind of addicted to, but you would never admit that you'd give it five stars. You'd probably give it like a two or a three, but at the same time, you are watching, you, you're binging it and you're watching it constantly. So yeah, I think implicit feedback uh, would be really cool. Unfortunately, we don't have that data for movie lens, but uh, there might be other data sets out there that we could use um, maybe in another tutorial. Cool, okay, so. Now let's look at what the um, highest and lowest rated movies are. So let's just, we've created mean ratings here, which is where we get the mean rating for a given movie. And we wanna know which movie has the lowest rating. So um, we get the index of that. And then what we can do with some great pandas manipulation is, oops, is um, yeah, so we're getting the index that has the lowest rating. And here we can see Gypsy is the lowest rated movie. Now highest rated, um, what we do is mean ratings, rating dot IDX max. And then, 
So let's just see what that looks like. Oops, sorry, I'm getting my notation mixed up. Okay, so the lowest rated movie is index 15, 53. And if we do this, we can see that uh, highest rated is Lamerica. But let's uh, see how many ratings Lamerica had because I have no idea what this movie is. I've never heard of it. I actually looked it up later. I think it's like a movie um, from the 90s. Um, and it didn't really have the, it isn't the most popular on other sites that I saw. Um, but we could see that it, it only had two ratings. So it did, it might have had a perfect 5.0 rating, but again, it only had two ratings. So a better approach to looking at what the most popular movies are and highly rated versus like lowest rated movies is to use something called the Bayesian average. So we do that um, by following this equation where we have C, which represents our confidence, multiplied by M, represent, re representing our prior, um, plus, and you add it with um, the sum of all of the reviews and divide it by C, and the um, count of all the reviews. So I, th I think it's easier to just like write this out ourselves and see what it looks like. But um, here I just wanna note that C represents our typical data set size. Um, and um, it's basically the average number of ratings for a given movie. M represents the average rating across all movies. So the first thing we need to do is get C and M. And to do that, um, what we do here is uh, use something called group by, which we did before. So we're getting ratings. We're grouping it by movie ID. We're getting rating. So for a given movie, we're getting their ratings and we are going to apply two aggregate functions. We're gonna apply the count aggregate function and the mean aggregate function. So, actually, so here for a given movie ID, we get, um, we see how many times it's been rated and also what the mean rating is. So C in this case uh, is, so we're using movie stats and we're gonna get the count and we're getting the mean count and then we're getting the mean mean for M. Let's just, so here we could see that the average number of ratings for a given movie is 10.37. The average rating for a given movie is 3.26. The Bayesian average now is going to be the equation we listed above. So I'll just implement it in Python. So we're doing C times M plus ratings dot sum and then we're dividing it by C plus ratings dot count. So ratings dot count is N and ratings dot sum is like the sum of all reviews or ratings that we have here. Okay, so um, we have our Bayesian average function. Let's just test this out on Lamerica. So um, the way that this works is um, we're gonna, the input, uh, the input of this function is a pandas series. And so what we have to do is pandas series five, five. So we're just saying, okay, these are the two ratings for Lamerica. We're passing this in here. And we see that the Bayesian average of Lamerica is 3.54. It's not as high as we originally thought it was. Um, what we can do now is apply this Bayesian average to all of our movies and really see which ones are, are the most popular. So let's go ahead and do that. We are going to get ratings, group by movie ID. Then we are going to get rating. So after grouping it by movie ID, we're going to get the rating. And then we're applying this aggregate function, which we developed ourselves. And let's just see what this looks like. So this gives us the Bayesian average. Um, 
The output of this right now is a pandas series. We want to have this as a data frame. So to do that, we easily just do reset index. Um, and then I'll show you in a sec what that does. So this creates a, it converts the series to a data frame. But the next step we want to do is um, rename the columns because uh, we want to make sure that we indicate that this is a Bayesian average rating. So I'm just going to rewrite the columns here. Um, so it's ba you just do the data frame dot columns and then list the column names. Um, so let's just see what that looks like. And then lastly, what we want to do is append Bayesian average ratings to our movie stats. And then I'll just show you what it looks like now. So we have the movie ID, movie count, mean, Bayesian average. But now we, let's find out what these movies actually are. Let's see what the titles are. To do that, we are going to now merge movies onto movie stats. So movies is our data frame with all the movie info. We are going to um, just get the, sorry, movie ID and title. So for those of you who aren't too familiar with pandas, what this is basically doing is it's creating a new data frame that only selects two columns from movies, movie ID and title. And we're gonna be merging it with movie stats. So let's see what this does. Okay, so we can see uh, we have the title here now. Let's sort our values by, oops. Let's sort our values by the Bayesian average. Okay, so um, we can do ascending equals false so that we get the highest to lowest rated uh, average ratings. And we see that Lamerica is no longer at the top. Um, the most popular and highest rated movies are in fact Shawshank Redemption, Godfather, Fight Club, Star Wars. Um, and this makes a lot more sense. Um, they're critically acc acclaimed films and they also have just had way more ratings. So 300, 192, 318. Um, we can now apply, we can now like reverse the order of the data frame to see what the lowest rating movies are, to see what the lowest rated movies are. So here you can see we applied ascending equals false. Um, the next thing we can do is ascending equals true. And that's just gonna, this line of code here will give us the top five lowest rating, rated movies according to the Bayesian average. So yeah, Speed 2, Battle Earth, Godzilla, Anaconda. Um, yeah, Gypsy's not in this list. I guess it's not so bad after all. But as you can see, these are um, not, not uh, very popular. Or people have given it lower ratings in general. So yeah, cool. OK, so the next thing we're going to do is take a glimpse at our movie genre. So we focus mainly on the ratings data frame this time. Um, Let's shift our focus now to the movies data frame. Um, so what we are going to do is, let's just remind ourselves of what this data frame looks like. So we have movie ID, movie title, and genre. Um, the first thing we wanna do is clean this up a bit because genre right now is just a string with all of the different genres um, separated by these pipes. Um, we can clean this up and kind of generate the, a list instead of this string. Um, and we do that by uh, applying this function to the genre column. So what we're gonna do is lambda x, x dot split, and we're splitting it by the pipe. So let's see what this does. Cool. So instead of having this string, we now have a list. Um, and uh, what we can do next is now count 
um, the most frequent genres in our data set. So uh, we can use this nifty function in Python called uh, the counter. And we, it's, it's original, like it's a Python function, but we have to import collections. So it's not like you have to do like a pip install. Um, what I meant to say is like, it's a Python function as in it comes, it's like, it's built in, but you have to install collections. So from collections import counter, and then to get the genre frequency, we're going to use the counter and do G, G for genre in movies, genre or G in genre. Okay, let's see what this does. So we can see what the most um, popular genre are. And we do that using this cool method um, that we can apply onto counter. So there, when you do uh, dot most common and you pass in five, it'll get us the five most common genre. Drama, comedy, thriller, action, romance. But you know what? Let's try to visualize this um, as a bar plot. So to do that, we are going to do genre frequency DF. That's going to be our new data frame we're creating. We're going to do data frame genre frequency. Let's see what this looks like. OK, so we have this weird looking data frame. This is not how we want it to look. What we need to do is flip it, flip this so that this row becomes a column. And to do that, we use the transpose function. So this is what the transpose function does. Um, but again, we see that um, the genre name is actually the index right now. That's not what we want. Um, we want this to be a separate column. So we used this um, reset index before. We're gonna do it again here. And there you have it. We now have um, our genre frequency data frame, where we have um, one column showing genre name, and then the other column showing the count of genres. So let's now rename these columns. So we have a genre, and then we can call this one count. Let's see how this looks like. Okay, so we can now easily plot this using Seaborn. And there is a pretty nice function called bar plot. You can do x equals genre, y equals count, data equals this data frame. Um, we cannot see what the x-axis is. It's, all overlapping, I think what we should do is rotate this. So we, we use, um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Seaborn, it's actually a library that's built off of um, matplotlib. So while the, ba like the base, fu the base uh, function we're using here is Seaborn, we can now apply um, additional steps to it from the matplotlib library. So matplotlib um, xtix, allows us to rotate the axis titles uh, by x degrees. So here we want to do rotation equals 90. Um, and it's a little easier to see. Um, another thing I want to do to this plot is maybe sort it by count. Ascending equals false so that we can see what the most popular genre are from highest to lowest. Cool. Um, another nice thing that I really like about Seaborn is that it has um, some really nice palettes you can apply. So this gives like a cool purple, blue, yellow palette, Viridis, or you could use Magma. So yeah, you can play around with that later uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. If you use R, um, this is also like these same palettes are available in ggplot. Okay, so great. We did all of our data explore exploration. Um, 
we have a better sense of what our movies and ratings data set look like. Now, the next step we wanna do is start pre-processing our data. So the way our data is currently formatted is like this. So we have user ID, movie ID, rating. But as I showed in the presentation, we need to create our user item matrix. And we need to have um, this matrix where we have users, movies, and then inside the matrix, we need to populate it with the actual ratings. And so um, I have already created a function called create, it's called create X. There are a couple of blanks that we're gonna fill in, but um, essentially what this does is creates this matrix and it also generates th four important dictionaries because um, when you create this, this um, this, this matrix, you need to keep track of which row represents which movie ID and which, or sorry, which row represents which user ID and which column represents which movie ID. Um, and so we have uh, created four different mappers. User mapper maps user ID to the user index. Movie mapper maps the movie ID to the movie index. Um, and then the inverse mapper does it the other way around. So it maps user index to user ID and then movie index to movie ID, if that makes sense. Cool, I'll, I'll show you as well um, as we go through this code. So I'm not gonna go into the details too much on this function, um, but essentially what we wanna do here is we're defining M and N. Um, in retrospect, maybe those aren't the best uh, variable names, but essentially M is number of movie IDs, and then N is number of, M is number of user IDs, N is number of movie IDs. Um, and then we create these two mappers. So we have a dictionary that maps user ID to the index that we're gonna have in our matrix, as well as movie mapper. Um, so, Let's just see how this works. Okay, so create X um, returns these five variables, X and then the four dictionaries. What I did here is I um, now applied create X. Um, and then, so, sorry, I'll uh, respond to that message in a sec. Um, so yeah, um, we're applying create X to ratings and we're generating these four mappers as well as X. Uh, one thing I wanna note though, is that we're using a CSR matrix, which is a sparse matrix uh, in Sci SciPy. Um, and so even though this is the size of our matrix, it's quite large, It all of the um, empty uh, cells that don't have any data, they're actually empty. Um, it's, it's quite space efficient. Whereas if we had this represented as a data frame, all of the empty cells would actually still take up uh, more space. So I'm just gonna show you what our user mapper looks like. So uh, this is our user ID and this is our uh, user index. So user ID is represented by index zero in our, in our um, X matrix, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, in this specific data set, our user IDs are quite clean. So it's like from one to X, um, but in some cases there could be very different user IDs where like ID nine, 999 is linked to index zero. And so this mapper is super important to make sure that the translations happen properly. Okay, so the next thing we wanna do is evaluate sparsity because this is really important to determine whether or not, um, it's, really, it's really important to know how sparse your data is to determine whether or not collaborative filtering is suitable uh, as a recommender. Because if you have data that's way too sparse, meaning maybe you have just so many rate, uh, movies with no ratings and so many users with no ratings, you're probably better off using content-based filtering. So let's just take a look at what we have here. So we're gonna get, we wanna know how many um, cells are in our matrix. So we do um, X shape 
zero times x shape one. We're just basically multiplying 610 by 907, 9,724. And then n ratings, um, we use this function called nnz. nnz um, counts the number of stored non-empty elements in our matrix. And so we then divide number of ratings by the total number of cells. And when we do that, we see that the sparsity is 1.7. So that's actually pretty good. Um, I've listened to lectures and heard um, and, and read things saying that on average, um, if you have a sparsity of 0.1 or above, you're good to go. But anything lower, you should probably consider content-based filtering. Okay, so now let's take a look at um, how many um, how many ratings our users have, like uh, who are our most active users. So we do that by doing get x dot n n z x is equals one. So we're just manipulating this this x matrix. We can confirm that it is indeed 610 users. And we see that our most active user has rated uh, over 2,000 movies, and our least active rate user has rated only 20 movies. Now let's see a uh, number of ratings per movie. So we do get an NZ, and then instead of axis equals one, we do axis equals zero. Um, and as you can see, uh, this represents the total number of movies. And then if we apply this, we see that the most rated movie has 329 ratings and the least rated movie only has one rating. Cool. So now let's just plot this out. And yeah, we see that for the most part, um, there are, most users have rated like, I don't know exactly what the scale is, but maybe like less than a hundred movies. Um, and then most movies have also like less than, definitely less than 50, 50 ratings. Have, they've been rated by less than 50 users essentially. Cool. Okay, so now that we have our X matrix, um, and we are pretty confident that we can continue with content collaborative filtering because um, we've seen that our data is not too sparse. Uh, what we can do is uh, start by generating our collaborative filtering model. So we're gonna be using a technique called K nearest neighbors. And essentially what we're doing is we're gonna find the K movies that have the most simu similar user engagement vectors to movie I. Um, again, I've created this function here that makes it very easy for us to just plug in the numbers. I have left a couple of empty um, blanks though, and I'm just gonna walk through how we do this. Um, so we're using this scikit-learn model called nearest neighbors. And here we want to uh, specify k plus one. So, sorry, let me just step back a second. So the input of, sim of find similar movies will be movie ID, x, which is our sparse, our user item matrix, movie mapper, movie inverse mapper, and k. Um, K here determines how many similar movies we want to find relative to movie ID, the movie ID of interest that, we, that, that uh, we're focused on. Uh, another thing that we have as our um, input is metric, which is a metric of that you can define within K nearest neighbors. So here it, uh, we're focusing on cosine similarity, but there are different metrics that you can look at like Euclidean, Manhattan, um, but for the most part, what I've from what I've seen, cosine is the most popular. 
Um, so here for n neighbors, we're going to do k plus 1 because um, the k and n output also includes the movie idea of interest. So um, we, we're going to actually remove the movie idea of interest and then in the end it'll give us just k. And then to fit our data, we are fitting x and we run this and apply it here. We um, are, so in this specific example, we're generating similar movies for movie ID one, um, and we are getting the 10 most similar movies to it. The output gives us the movie, the, the recommended movie IDs, but um, one nice thing for us to do is um, generate this so that it's more like user friendly and we can read what the actual recommendations are. Like we don't even know what movie ID one is right now. So to do that, we are going to create a movie titles dictionary, which um, which um, returns a Sorry, so we're going to create a movie title dictionary which maps movie ID to movie title. So let's just do that first and see what it looks like. So here we could see movie ID one is Toy Story, Jumanji, Grumpy Old Men. Cool. And then we're just going to repeat the same steps that we did above. But here we are going to do print movie titles i. So um, because you watched movie title and here movie title, we're getting the title of movie ID one. These are your recommendations. So because you watched Toy Story, we recommend all of these other movies, which I actually think is pretty cool. Um, the most similar movies to Toy Story are Toy Story 2, Jurassic Park, Independence Day. They're all sort of family friendly movies from the 90s. Cool. Um, in this section, I kind of just talk about how you can try out different metrics. So there's Euclidean, Manhattan. Um, if you go to the KNN library, so nearest neighbors. SK learn. Uh, we can see that there are um, different metrics to play around with. And you can check out the dist distance metrics here. All right, so um, collaborative filtering is great and all, but what happens when we have um, movies that don't have any ratings or that um, have very few ratings? And also when we have users that have very few ratings. This is where content-based filtering comes in. And we're gonna basically repeat this whole process we did above uh, using k nearest neighbors but instead of using ratings we're going to look at the genre so as you recall earlier we um, had the movies data frame which had movies the title and then the genre um, we're going to create a matrix that generates um, we're going to create a matrix that represents um, all the genre for move for different movies and then apply KNN using using this technique so um, it'll get it'll make more sense as we continue on, but let me just get started here. Okay, so first, let's see how many movies we have in our data set. We already know this 9,742 9, unique movies, and then to get the genre, we're gonna do. So we're gonna get all of the unique genre. Oops. G for G. We kind of already did this before, but I'm just going to repeat it for clarity. Whoops. Okay, so these are our unique genre. 
And then we're gonna loop over genre. We're looping over this set and we're gonna create a new column. So let me show you how this is done. We're gonna create a new column that um, for each genre and um, how we do this is we do movie genre, transform, and then lambda x, and then int g and x. Oops. Cool. And so if we just take a look at movies, we now um, see that instead of having this one genre column, we've spread it out into multiple columns and that are all binary, where one represents uh, that this movie does have this genre and zero means that this movie does not have this genre, if that makes sense. Um, but in order for us to create like a nice matrix with this, we're gonna have to drop movie ID, title and genre. And I do that in this line here. So let me just inspect this for you so we can see what it looks like. Cool. So each row here represents a separate movie. Now, the next thing we want to do is um, use something called cosine similarity, which again is a tool from scikit-learn. And we're going to apply this to movie genre against movie genre to measure the similarity between movies based on their genre features. So we applied this cosine similarity and we see that, that the shape is number of movies by number of movies and is populated with zeros and one. Uh, it, it's populated with uh, values between zero and one, which represent the degree of similarity between movies along the X and Y axes. Um, so again, I can just show you what that looks like. So So this means it's very similar. One means it's very similar. Zero means it's not similar at all in terms of genre. Okay, so now let's um, create a movie finder function. Um, with this movie finder function, it'll just be very easy for us to write a title of a movie that we're interested in and get the movie ID for us. Because before I was showing you these dictionaries and mapping an ID to a title and um, instead, why don't we just create a function? So uh, in this example, we're gonna use a package called Fuzzy Wuzzy. Um, I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with it, but it's a pretty cool tool that you can use. And it's going to, um, generate, it, it, it's basically going to take in the title that you give it and find out what the most similar title is in our data set. Um, because I don't know if you've noticed, but if we take a look at movies again, we can see that the title is very specific and I might forget to add 1999, but 1995 beside Jumanji. I just want to know what the index is for Jumanji. So let me just show you how this works. So we're going to get all of the titles from movies and then we're going to use this um, fuzzy wuzzy function called process extract one where we pass in the title of interest and we compare it against all titles. And then it's going to return the closest match. So we can try this out with Jumanji. And here we can see like we, we misspelled Jumanji, but the closest title to this string is Jumanji 1995, which is pretty cool. Um, and so now that we have Movie Finder, we are now going to map this to Movie Index. So we see that uh, for the um, movie title Jumanji, the index is one. Not, so 
before we saw that the movie ID of the movie ID one is Toy Story, I believe, but the index is um, something different. Sorry, if, if that if that confused you, let let me know and I can walk through it again. But um, I realized maybe I should have given more context. So the movie ID index is one, but then the movie ID I believe is two. Okay. So using this handy movie index dictionary paired with our movie finder function, we're now going to see what the most similar movies are to Jumanji based on our genre features that we've generated. And so to do that, I have created um, this uh, sim scores list and I'm just going to show you like in step by step what's going on. Okay, so we have cosine similarity and then we're going to get the index that we've defined for Jumanji. So we're picking out the one the one row that has all of the um, similar movie comparisons to Jumanji. And we see that it returns a list of tuples. The um, tuples here represent the movie index and the score. So the next thing we have to do is we want to sort this from highest to lowest score. Um, and we're going to do that by doing sorted sim scores, key lambda x, x1. Um, what this is doing is it's getting the second element of, the of all the tuples and sorting just that. We don't, we don't want to sort it by movie index. We want to sort it by the second element, um, which is the score. Okay. And then reverse equals true because we want it to be um, in descending order. So let's take a look at what's going on. Um, sim scores. Let's do. So we're going to get one, two, n recommendations plus one. Um, so the reason why I'm starting at index one and not zero is because index zero here actually represents Jumanji the movie. Um, and we don't want that to be as, um, incorporated in our recommendations. Okay. Let's see what this looks like. Cool. So these are the most popular movie indices. And to get similar movies, I'm going to do similar movies equals I O for I and sim scores. So I, I'm basically just getting the um, the first element of all the tuples, which is the movie index. Let's see what this looks like. Cool. Now what we want to do is um, translate this from uh, the index to the uh, movie title. So we can see because you watch Jumanji, here are all of the most similar movies um, that are given to you based on, on uh, similar, on, based on the genre features. Cool. We can see that they're pretty uh, they look pretty good. Uh, they're all sort of family friendly movies um, from the 90s or from earlier. And uh, what I've done here in this example is I've kind of compressed all the steps that we did into a single function. So you can play with this on your own if you'd like. So we can see for Toy Story, um, it generates Ants, Toy Story 2, Adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle. Um, and you can also play around with how many recommendations you'd like to generate. 
All you really need though, like the core of this whole recommender is the um, cosine similarity matrix that we created. A lot of the rest of this code is just manipulation. Awesome. Okay, so the last section um, that I wanted to go through was dimensional dimensionality reduction with matrix factorization. Um, and this is really important when you have a sparse data set, because when you have a sparse data set, it's really hard to find similar movies. Um, and it's also very computationally intensive to work with such a massive matrix. So uh, what matrix factorization is, is um, it's a linear algebra technique that helps us discover latent features underlying the interactions between users and movies. Um, and so essentially what it's creating is um, two latent matrix matrices. So a user factor matrix and an item factor matrix where uh, we have the users by K latent features. And here we could think of a latent feature as some compressed feature that can't we can't really explain. But an example could be like uh, for a, a movie latent feature could be like foreign films focused on Japanese anime, for example, or um, uh, indie movies from the 90s. So we're basically compressing our original matrix into something more condensed and it's creating like a taste dimension for us where we're just really uh, focusing on the user tastes or on the specific um, flavor of a movie. Um, again, like I said, we cannot interpret what each latent feature K represents. Um, but uh, yeah, here I explained that uh, if an example of a latent feature could be users who like romant romantic com comedies from the 90s or movies which are independent foreign language films. Um, so to one way of uh, computing matrix factorization is to use a technique called um, single value decomposition, so SVD. And again, this is something that we're going to be using from um, scikit-learn. Um, and to do that, we are going to define how many components we want. So here, K represents number of components. Um, okay. And then number of iterations is just how many times you want to iterate over this. At, until we converge. So I guess more iterations is better, but um, it's also more computationally complex. So it's a bit of a trade-off. And then Q in this case, um, we actually need to get the transform of X. So we had movies by users, or sorry, users by movies. The way that SVD works, we actually need to do um, movies by users. And it's going to, we're going to be creating this Q object. So we have N movies. The output of, of Q is um, N movies by N components that we've defined. Uh, yes, that is a good question. So um, N components is a hyperparameter. N iterations is not. So N components is a hyperparameter that we can tune. And the more components we have, the less compressed. Um, whereas the fewer components, so let's say we only want five components, they'll be more compressed. And there's sort of this um, happy number that we need to find that will generate the most um, accurate recommendations for us. Here, I just chose 20. Um, and essentially what we're doing is we're, we're going from um, like over like over hundreds of it's a, instead of having a column that or sorry, let me just instead of having a matrix where there are 610 columns for movies, we're now creating a matrix where there are only 20 columns for movies. So we're compressing all of this down to 20. The more we compress this down, uh, the more compact the info is. At some point, we're going to start losing information. Um, 
so yeah, it's important to find a good number there. Um, and there are techniques to tune this, um, but we're not gonna go into that today because with that, you need to define what you're trying to optimize. You need to kind of define an evaluation metric. Um, but again, maybe I can go through this uh, another time. Okay, so Q shape, we have number of movies by number of components. Um, movie ID, uh, let's just do that here. And then we're using um, similar, the, the find similar movies function we had above, but instead of passing an X, we're going to be passing in the uh, output of SVD, so Q. But again, um, Q, like the way that find similar movies works is it actually needs the, um, the components by number of movies, not the other way around. So we have to kind of reverse the transpose that we did earlier. And so let's see how this works. Cool. So we see here that there are um, similar, there's a list of movies that are similar to Toy Story that are all from the 90s. And again, like sort of family movies. Um, and whether or not this is better than the non-matrix factorization approach, I'm not sure. Um, there are many ways to evaluate that, like I mentioned, uh, but I'm not going to be covering that in the tutorial today. Um, yeah, so this is the last step that I wanted to go through. It shows how you would go about generating recommendations using the compressed movie factor matrix. Um, and maybe I'll quickly go through what some examples of evaluation metrics are. Um, are there any questions though in the meantime? Okay, so I'm just going to take this slideshow from what I've done in the past. Um, and I'm just gonna quickly go through how we would go about evaluating a, a recommender system um, and, and some of the metrics that we would consider. So how do we evaluate recommendations? In traditional machine learning, as some of you are probably aware, you have your original data set and you split it uh, like in the middle with a training set and a test set. Um, but this unfortunately won't work for recommendation systems because if you split it in the middle, you could be having like some users only in the training set and then some users only in the test set. Um, that won't work because you'll train it on users that are in train and the you'll train it on users that won't be found in the test set. So what we have to do here is actually mask our matrix. Instead of cutting it in half or masking different values in our matrix, pretending as if we didn't know what a user rated. And then to evaluate the performance of our model, we pretend what we don't know what they rated, and then we generate the recommendations and we compare what they rated versus what our, record, what our predicted rating was. And that is how, sorry, that is how we evaluate the performance. So some approaches here are to look at um, root mean squared error, precision, recall, F1. Um, precision, recall, F1, these are all information retrieval metrics. And specifically, what is very popular in the recommender system world is to look at precision at K. So of the top K recommendations, what proportion are relevant, as well as recall. So the proportion of items that were found in the top K recommendations. Precision um, is tr the number of true positives over true positives plus false positives. Whereas recall is the true positives over true positives plus false negatives. So here we can see that precision is trying to minimize false positives and recall is trying to minimize false negatives. So uh, an example of false positive would be 
predicting that a user, um, I guess, including a movie in a recommendation that, sh that shouldn't have been in that recommendation. And then recall would be uh, include, not including a movie in a recommendation that you should have included, if that makes sense at all. Okay, so, um, oh, sorry, one last thing I wanted to say. So precision at K, precision at, at recall at K, here K represents the number of recommendations you're looking at. So um, you could say five, 10, 100, um, yeah. Um, other important considerations for a recommender system are to uh, consider interpretability, um, efficiency and scalability. So I know from my experience trying to build a recommender system, you could try to build something so accurate and perfect that gives what you think are awesome recommendations, but if it's not scalable and you can't run it on a regular basis, it's probably not a good approach for a production level recommender. Um, also considering diversity. So how diverse are the recommendations? Uh, considering the serendipity factor, like uh, suggesting um, movies to someone that they probably wouldn't have considered otherwise. Um, so yeah, recommenders are pretty awesome. I hope you kind of got a taste of what it's like to build a content-based filtering and collaborative-based filtering model. Um, and if you have any questions or want to chat about it more, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, so yeah, that's, that kind of wraps up my tutorial. Um, thanks, everyone. Are there any questions? Okay, how do you how do you convert precision recall ROC receiver operating curve ETC when your result is continuous instead of binary? If we're trying to guess that someone would have rated and the true is 95, but we guess 94 wrong. That's wrong, but not very wrong. Right. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I know that there are other techniques uh, to evaluate the results uh, that aren't uh, re that aren't like precision recall and whatnot. Um, but uh, yeah, I, sorry, I don't really have an answer for you right now. I can get back to you and, and look into this, um, but good question. Cool, well, if there aren't, if, if you have more questions, um, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my email, maybe I'll just post it here, katesjill at gmail.com. Okay, another question. Could you please say a bit about what motivates people to build recommendation systems using deep learning? Hmm. So I, I can't say too much about why people, like what motivates people to build recommendation systems using deep learning in a production level environment, um, because as we know, the more data you have and the more complex um, your system becomes, the harder it is to implement some sexy, cool model like deep learning. In the research space though, there's tons of research going towards um, building more accurate or more interesting, effective models uh, using deep learning um, that maybe at some point can become production level. I think really the barrier though is uh, computation. So as we become more efficient with um, building deep, deep learning recommenders, I'm sure that um, it'll become more prevalent. 
But I know from my experience, even um, at my current job, we deal with massive data sets. So while all these awesome and interesting machine learning models are really cool and can generate really awesome um, predictions, it's not the most practical thing to have when you're dealing with petabytes of data. How would you implement a shift in users taste in time as people age their ratings might be different? Um, yeah, so there definitely is a time component to consider. What you could do is um, kind of create. So one thing I didn't really share with you is uh, the concept of implicit feedback and also kind of generating your own score. So like I showed before, uh, for users, or so, so in the user item matrix, we have users, items, and then it's populated with all of these different values. In our example, all of these values were explicit ratings of users. But what you can do is generate your own composite score. So maybe what you could do is have it weighted towards time. And instead of, so you could have like, a rating and you multiply it by some time factor. And that's one way to kind of consider the shift in taste over time. Um, and also to consider other factors like implicit feedback uh, features. So one example of a score is in your, in your cell that you have in your matrix, you could have your explicit rating times some time variable and then add in some implicit feedback information. So maybe you could see, did they actually watch the whole movie or did they replay the movie? Did they stop it at the very beginning? Like all of these different features you can create, you can add yourself and um, create your own score. Um, one thing I would like to add though is when, from my experience, when I created, I have created my own score, I would consider the behaviors that I wanted to drive among my users. So back in the day, I created this medical recommendation, medical research paper recommender. And uh, I had all these different features like number of views, how long the, did they read it? Um, did they just read the abstract or the whole paper? And one feature that I wanted to drive further was reading it for a very long time. So I didn't consider whether they liked it or shared it. I only wanted to focus on the length of time that they spent reading it. And that's what I populated with myself. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, I've heard AWS and Google both offer recommendation engines as a service. I personally haven't used these before, um, but I'd really like to try it out and see what it's like. I guess my one worry with AWS is that, especially from my experience working at a startup, things can get very expensive. So if you have a big budget or if you have a big budget, like that's awesome, you should definitely try using it. But in situations where you, uh, have this recommender system that's part of your business and you really need it to be running on a, on a frequent basis and you don't ha have the resources to, to use AWS, I'd say doing it in-house is the way to go. Things just get so expensive with uh, these cloud platforms. How often do you retrain the recommendation model? I think it really depends. Um, it depends how fresh you need your data to be. I'm sure I have no experience uh, or no knowledge about how it works at Amazon, Netflix, or any of these companies, but I'm, I have a feeling that some of them are retrained on a pretty frequent basis. Um, and they also consider things like if you shopped for toilet paper today, should they be recommending toilet paper for you tomorrow because you already purchased it? No. Um, so there's a lot of logic involved there too. And um, same goes for movies. So uh, one step I didn't show in our process was post-processing, but let's say you already watched this movie before and you rated it highly. Should we include that in our recommendations? Probably not because you already watched it. Um, 
So yeah. Can I talk about the infrastructure to productionize a model? Um, there are many different ways to productionize a model. Um, I could speak briefly about how I worked on building a production type model back in the day. Um, this is in my previous role when I worked on the medical research recommender that I, I talked about. So uh, how it worked was we basically took in the data from SQL. We transfer, we had all these different steps, just like what I mentioned in our tutorial. So we had our pre-processing step where we wrangled the data into the right format we were looking for. So in this case, we created a user item matrix. We populated the cells with this score that I talked about. So we incorporated both explicit feedback and implicit feedback. And then we um, trained our model using so there are many different ways to train a model. We use something called a, a alternating least squares, ALS, where we fill in the, the values of the matrix, predicting what we think a user would like. And we evaluated it based on what they actually did like. And with this technique, we tuned our hyperparameters and um, found and created our best model. And then from there, we uh, kind of generated these recommendations for people, wrote it, spit, spit it out to a SQL table. And that is how the interface, like the interface that the person was looking at would then fetch the, the, the data from the SQL output, if that makes sense. How often do you retrain the recommendation model? Um, so I read, well, from my experience, I think we retrained it like twice a week, only because it was very expensive. Um, again, like depends on your budget. If it's very expensive to, to run a model, you probably don't want to be running it every day, um, maybe once or twice, twice a week. Um, yeah. Another thing I wanted to mention actually was I talked about all these evaluation metrics and how we can kind of guess what a user would like and evaluate it based on our, our own perceptions using offline data. But I think really the gold standard for any um, recommender to evaluate is to do A-B testing. So to kind of expose recommendations to one group of people versus not versus not exposing it to the other and see how well your recommender performs. Is it actually generating more activity among your users? Um, is it actually like getting more people to view movies. Um, I think A-B testing is, is the way to go, but sometimes that's not available. So that's where we do offline evaluation, which I talked about briefly. Cool. Okay, well, it seems like there aren't any other questions, but these are really awesome and interesting questions. I'd love to chat more with all of you about it. And you can do so if you're interested in, in it uh, by contacting me. I'm also going to be attending a few of these lectures, which I'm pretty excited about. So yeah. Um, thank you so much, Joe. I just wanted to, to chime in here and, and thank you again. Um, if there's anything you'd want to share with uh, the attendees here and, and then the greater sort of uh, list of attendees, I could put that on the Whova app and also make sure that they have that in the, in the email that goes out after this. Um, feel free to, to message me. And yeah, thank you. This was fantastic, very helpful. And I really appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to share your, your experience here. Thanks, yeah, thanks for having me. It was, it was awesome like leading everyone through this. <laughs> we, we'll be in touch and um, I will um, invite everybody else to still, there's still some workshops you can register for that still have space in them. And then uh, again, Wednesday, Thursday, we'll be joining on the platform for the breakouts and, and keynotes. So thank you, Joe. Thank you everybody for attending and we will see you shortly. Thanks. Bye everyone. <laughs>